Yeah, I was just going to ask that actually yeah. because I, I'm going to show lots of brain pictures and I think it'll be easier. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for the introduction. Um, can everybody hear me okay? I have to apologize. I, I got a little sick and so my voice is, usually I'm too loud. So maybe Everyone's I'm, sick. I, I know, yeah. So, <laughs> I'll, I guess this is an indication here that the front row is empty, but uh, great. So like Mark said, I'll be talking about uh, prefrontal inhibitory processes uh, that underlie the volitional control over our behavior. Um, obviously this work and uh, this type of work in neuroscience takes uh, a lot of people to conduct, so I'll just quickly uh, say thanks to my graduate and postdoc advisor, uh, Marie Banich, my collaborator um, since first year of, of grad school, and, and the person who lets me use EEG or P equipment, uh, Tim Curran, uh, Dr. Lisa Brenner at the Denver Veterans Administration, uh, who does uh, the recruiting of the PTSD populations that we look at. Um, and then obviously uh, the neuroscience group at Boulder, tons of undergraduates and research assistants that, that with, without uh, their help this work would uh, not be possible. So to start off with a, a quick overview for today, um, I'll talk about what I mean by inhibitory control um, and then how we started building a theoretical model um, of inhibitory control. We'll look at it first in a single psychological domain. We'll look at inhibitory control over long-term memory. Uh, we'll look at some behavior and some neuroimaging. And, uh, and then we'll get to multiple psychological domains. So inhibitory control over uh, memory, emotion, and motor. And we'll look at this with behavior and, and neuroimaging as well. And then we'll uh, you know, this work obviously is, is, uh, leads to the translation in, in inhibitory control deficits in psychiatric uh, conditions. So we'll, we'll look at uh, some PTSD work that I've done and then some conclusions. So <clears throat> my view of inhibitory control is really this uh, coordinated inhibition um, of, of uh, unwanted or irrelevant information um, and we can see this, uh, that this is critical for, for goal-directed behavior. And some examples are uh, control over our memories, control over our emotion and, and uh, motor response. So when I talk about inhibitory control, what I'm really talking about is that uh, uh, the prefrontal cortex has really been evolved to kind of globally modulate uh, lower order posterior and non-neocortical um, uh, subcortical processing in, in different regions. And we can think of this as inhibitory or cognitive control uh, or executive function. Those are some of the terms that, that people usually call it. Um, and some of the questions that we wanted to ask were what were the processes uh, so how is inhibitory control acquired? 
what is the temporal course of inhibitory control uh, across when, it, when it's um, being invoked? What are the neural pathways? Um, are there general uh, mechanisms for it? Are there common, uh, general and common versus distinct mechanisms for it uh, when you look across psychological domain? And then how are they organized? What is the, uh, the crosstalk across pathways? Um, and how do they interact with each other? So I first started to look at this uh, in, in memory. And the reason that uh, I did so was because I was really interested in the selection between irrelevant versus relevant information. This is something that guides our decisions in everyday life. It's important for uh, prospective decision making. And what I would argue is that our ability to control our awareness of unwanted memories or thoughts uh, theoretically may engage some similar processes. So to understand this uh, better, we started out using the uh, think-no-think paradigm. I'm not sure if you're uh, familiar with this task, but it's basically a memory version of the go-no-go -no -go task. A go-no-go -no -go task simply involves overriding a prepotent motor response. So you have some prepotency to respond to a stimulus uh, and then in some of the cases you're, you're told to, to withhold that response. Instead of, and this has been used for uh, decades in, in psychiatric populations to assess inhibitory control. But the think no think looks at this in a manner of <laughs> overriding the prepotent response to retrieve uh, some, some long-term memory. And I would suggest that this is important to assess other types of inhibitory control uh, um, as opposed to just motor response. So we used uh, emotional and pictorial stimuli in this task as it reflects uh, more ecologically valid circumstances. Uh, the original paradigm that this is based on simply used uh, neutral verbal stimuli. This paradigm includes three phases, a training, an experimental, and a testing phase. Uh, I'm going to go through these so that you know exactly what occurs uh, when individuals are given this task. So individuals get a cue, and they get a target, and they simply are told to uh, remember this cue target association. And they get somewhere around 40 pairs, depending on uh, what the specific paradigm is. And after they've <coughs> learned these 40 pairs, they're assessed on them, or after they've uh, been shown the 40 pairs, they simply get the cue and are told to uh, pick which of the previously associated pictures was the target. It's a forced choice uh, uh, recall task or recognition task. Um, and they have to uh, get 95% accuracy over those 40 pairs. So basically, individuals learn these Q target pairings. How many times do you present the uh, Until they get 95%. Usually, it's uh, in, with, with paradigms that are 40 pairs, it's usually uh, two or three repetitions. They, f they get them in blocks of 20. So they see 20, they get tested, they see 20, get tested, then they see all 40 again. Uh, once they've learned this to the 95% uh, degree uh, accuracy or percentage accuracy, they go to the experimental phase, which in one condition, uh, they are told to think about uh, the previously associated target that was paired with it, uh, if, the, if the border is green. And if the border is red, they're told that they should not let this previously associated picture enter consciousness. And this is the case in which uh, the fMRI uh, studies acquire the data. So it's really within this experimental phase, we've changed it up to, to look at other phases of the experiment, but this is the crucial period uh, when individuals are invoking uh, cognitive control. So the first example, mm -hmm. there was a correct, response and an uncorrect and a wrong one. Right. Was the wrong one 
correctly associated with some other cue? Yes. Okay. Yep. There are all, all the cues are taken, uh, all, all the, the testing targets are taken from the original set of trained material. So you can't use novelty as, 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 as a deciding factor. So just to be clear, sure. when this is the fMRI data point. Yes. Here. And so when you see the red square, mm -hmm. you're not supposed to think about the blue monkey that it's associated with. Exactly. Seems counterintuitive. <laughs> uh, well, that's a good point because what what we do is we actually give 10 to 16 different repetitions of this. So individuals have an opportunity to uh, invoke this cognitive control that many times. Importantly, um, this either the think or the no think phase occurs in 32 of the 40 pairings. So there's 16 think pairs, there's 16 no think pairs. They repeatedly do it uh, 10 to 16 times. The eight remaining cues that they don't see or the eight remaining pairs that they don't see serve as baseline items in which think and no think items are or can be compared to. Does that make sense? So we have some baseline items for for normal uh, memory uh, performance. And you acquire fMRI data mm -hmm. with the baseline pairs? No, they're not shown in this in the think no think phase. They're just tested at the end. So the testing phase, right? So individuals simply receive a cue. They're told to write down a short description of the target, and the eight that aren't shown, then you can compare them to. Uh, the primary behavioral uh, effect that's been replicated several times, if you look at, okay, <laughs> ba baseline corrected accuracy scores, so everything above zero is increased recall, everything below zero is decreased recall. Repetitions, we measured them after five repetitions and after 10 repetitions, right? So no think in red, think in green, as you can see, the take home message here is simply that uh, after 10 repetitions, you get an increase in recall for, for the think items and a decrease in recall for the no think items. And these are all significantly, uh, are, are all significant effects here. Okay. What's your M? Well, this is. It's, well. 120, 150. Subject? Yeah. This is, this is uh, just the behavioral effect. So we've run the behavioral paradigm many, many, many times. Okay. So what we wanted to do was look at the neural mechanisms then of uh, 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 inhibitory control over long-term memory. I feel really silly holding this, but I guess I'll be all right. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> so um, right, we wanted to look uh, at this effect in the uh, uh, fMRI machine, and we know that volitional inhibitory control involves activation in regions of the right lateral prefrontal cortex. This has been seen uh, in motor response uh, and emotion regulation. And the question really is, well, is the right lateral prefrontal cortex also associated with inhibitory control over long-term memory? And more specifically, does it coincide with downregulation of any kind of posterior subcortical regions? Obviously, one candidate would be the hippocampus or, or, or uh, medial temporal lobe. So when we look at the fMRI results, we'll talk about it in two parts. We'll talk about first the sources of inhibitory control. So what are the regions that are more active for no think versus think trials? So what we see is that the right lateral prefrontal cortex and all three of the primary gyri here have been uh, activated and are more upregulated for no think than think trials. Uh, like I've, I've said before, it's involved in uh, inhibitory and cognitive control. Um, 
And this increased activity uh, really during no-think trial suggests that th these areas are being recruited for some type of inhibitory control or some process that, that is associated with inhibitory control. So now what we do is we look at the sites of inhibitory control. So where is it possible that that inhibitory control has been directed? Uh, when we see blue here, we know that it's specifically more reg upregulated in think trials than no think trials. So it's downregulated now in no think trials. The first area that we see is the pulvinar nucleus of the thalamus. Um, responsible for uh, controlling the amount of visual information to ear early visual cortex. The fusiform gyrus, um, we know this is uh, specific to process visual representations like objects and faces. Um, and then last, the, the hippocampus, the parahippocampal gyrus and the amygdala all show down regulation. Uh, we know that these areas are highly involved, the hippocampus in uh, encoding consolidation and retrieval. Um, we know the amygdala is responsible for generating a, uh, emotional response, and that the two share bi-directional connectivity for the modulation of learning memory. If we look at correlations with behavior, so what happens if you take somebody's uh, behavioral performance and you do a whole brain correlation, so uh, the more somebody inhibits long-term memory, uh, what areas of the brain are correlated with this. And we see one spot in the prefrontal cortex, um, the right middle frontal gyrus. And we see one spot being deregulated, bilateral hippocampus. So it looks as though uh, the brain behavior relationship also involves this upregulation of right middle frontal gyrus and downregulation of, of the bilateral hippocampus. So now if we do a functional connectivity analysis uh, and we do partial uh, regression with it, uh, which just simply means we're going to take these areas, we're going to extract the time series across the course of the experiment. So you have right middle frontal gyrus here, hippocampus here, you extract the time series from that. You correlate the two time series together, you get some value. Um, and when we do this across all the regions in the brain uh, that were activated or deactivated for the no-think trial specifically, what we see is that the right inferior frontal gyrus correlates negatively with the visual cortex during the first half of the experiment. So here, suggesting that upregulation of, of the right inferior frontal gyrus uh, corresponds with downregulation of the visual cortex. And during the second half of this experiment, the right middle frontal gyrus appears to uh, show the, the uh, greatest communication or negative correlation with the hippocampus and amygdala, uh, both. So upregulation of right middle frontal gyrus, downregulation of hippocampal and amygdala activity. Yes? Yeah, MRI studies are between 16 and 22. Sure. So, okay. So the summary for uh, the fMRI portion is that um, inhibitory control over long-term memory seems to be this complex process. It seems to involve right lateral prefrontal cortex and the down regulation of posterior and subcortical regions. Um, and one key aspect, because of this correlation with uh, behavioral performance, um, involves the right MFG's communication uh, to decrease the activation in, in the hippocampal complex. So now we have a preliminary model of inhibitory control over long-term memory retrieval. If we look at this cartoon of the brain, we can see right IFG. Uh, it seems to turn on uh, or be more active in earlier stages, and it connects to ventral visual processing stream, visual cortex, and then uh, another component, which would be right MFG, uh, connecting to the, uh, the hippocampus. Okay, 
So we've assessed this now with fMRI. Uh, we've looked at it with functional connectivity. We've done correlations with behavior. Um, and what we want to do now is look at this uh, through anatomy somewhat. So I would say the importance of this is really to understand how the eff efficacy of inhibitory control over uh, behavior may be related to neuroanatomy of the regions that institute and that are under control. And uh, we've looked at this in a number of ways. We've looked at this volumetrically with gray matter, with white matter, with white matter integrity, with cortical thickness, uh, some of which I'll talk about today. Um, but what I would suggest is that it could be the case that inhibitory control over or, or uh, prefrontal modulation over posterior or subcortical regions may be related somehow um, uh, to the volume or some anatomical features of the regions. So the question was relatively simple. We wanted to ask whether the right MFG uh, inhibitory control over the hippocampal complex is really dependent on the, the neuroanatomy. So what we did next is, is to automatically segment um, um, subcortical regions and this is basically a volume-based vertex shape comparison. Um, and <clears throat> what you look at here is that it uh, automatically segments the subcortical regions into 13 counterparts, uh, 12 counterparts and one, uh, the brain stem. And you can select out various regions to look at uh, the full volume and the shape as well. Sure. Oh, the segmentation? Uh, it's exceptionally consistent across individuals. I mean, the, the idea is, is that it's based on models. So they're models from Harvard, um, and I believe it's based on 302 uh, individuals, and it's a uh, extremely time-intensive registration process. And it bases, so for instance, within the hippocampus here, it's probably based, I think, on three to 400 vertices. And so the reg registration of it is, uh, is pretty specific. Um, there are other registration tools that are better uh, that we've started using, stuff like Presurfer, uh, if anyone knows what, what that is. Um, uh, but this is still very good. Uh, and Presurfer, uh, we'll talk about it later. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, so what do we find when we look at uh, segmentation and, and uh, uh, volume of the hippocampal anatomy? And it might be something that seems paradoxical, but when you look, uh, if you look at the graph here, and you see increased recall and then decreased recall, uh, and you do correlations with the, the volume of this region, Individuals seem to have better control over the hippocampus, not just inhibitory, but also uh, facilitative recall with smaller hippocampal volumes. Uh, sorry, hippocampal complex volumes. And we've also tested this with uh, the amygdala as well. It didn't seem to have any relationship. This was non-significant. We used that as our control region because it's in the model. Um, <coughs> but we had no significant relationship there. Okay. Yeah, I sure. Small different campus is good. Yeah. For control, as, as far as control is related. Right, That's just, it seems uh, paradoxical. Um, and obviously stuff from, from clinical populations would suggest otherwise, but you never know the relationship between clinical populations and normal populations. It's, it's, it can vastly differ. So not only uh, did smaller hippocampal complex predict greater inhibitory control over long-term memory retrieval, but also if you look at increased functional connectivity uh, of the right MFG in the hippocampus, uh, sorry, if you look at the functional connectivity of the hippocampus in the, in the right middle frontal gyrus, it also suggests that 
there's better functional connectivity between the two when uh, the hippocampus is smaller. Not only that, but if we look at specifically the, the vertices that show this differentiation, uh, this is just one side, but it seems to be rooted more in this posterior region of the, the hippocampus versus more anterior regions of the hippocampus. So, uh, real quickly as a summary, just reductions in, in volume of the bilateral hippocampal uh, complex predicted inhibitory success, as well as uh, communication between the, the right middle frontal gyrus and the hippocampus. And I would suggest that understanding neuroanatomical features of these pathways helps better define your theoretical model. Uh, and we've done this in several, several different facets. And it's really uh, started, what this did was start to suggest, well, maybe there's something about posterior aspects of the hippocampal complex. Um, so now what we have is a, a more refined model of inhibitory control over long-term memory retrieval. So what we see now is that Really, we're talking and, and focusing on right middle frontal gyrus with connections to the posterior hippocampal complex, right? So this is, would be, as some term, uh, the medial pathway. And uh, going through the cingulum bundle uh, to posterior parahippocampal gyrus, uh, retrosplenial cortex, and as well, uh, there's a lateral pathway which probably is involved more with encoding. So through the frontal occipital fasciculus, the right MFG connects to more anterior regions, the subiculum, um, for the perforant pathway or, or where most of the information from multisensory cortex uh, enters the hippocampus. <clears throat> so now we have better anatomical defining. Um, and we've assessed this now through fMRI, through functional connectivity, correlations with behavior and anatomy. So this is fine, but how, we wanted to ask how might uh, inhibitory control over long-term memory be implemented? So this doesn't really suggest any kind of mechanism yet, it just suggests the brain regions that might be involved. And we know that retrieval of long-term memory representations requires pattern completion. Um, and this is really a process that feeds backwards from the hippocampus uh, to surrounding multimodal sensory cortex or, or MTL regions uh, to activate the component representations that make up uh, a composite representation. So we can think about this as some kind of associated cue in the environment. When we see this, it feeds forward to the hippocampus and then the hippocampus feeds back to uh, proje or projects back and, and feeds back to um, uh, activate associated memory representations of, of a specific uh, contextual event. So <clears throat> this process is known to involve neural synchrony um, and uh, or oscillations and it's really about this coordinated firing pattern uh, in disparate brain regions um, that are really crucial for long-term memory. So if you have these uh, component representations that need to fire in some coordinated pattern for, for a composite representation, uh, it's through this neural oscillatory behavior. So we wanted to ask uh, whether there's evidence that the neural oscillations are affected. One way in which we wanted to do this or we could approach this is to use uh, EEG to assess the neural oscillations. So we know that for information transfer to occur, sending neurons or assemblies uh, must be coupled to receiving neurons such that both are exci excitable at the same time. Um, and this synchronized neural firing uh, between these cell assemblies during information transfer creates uh, this measurable oscillatory behavior. So some of the hypotheses we had for this is that Neural oscillations in the alpha band have uh, been conceived of uh, areas that are not being recruited for, for processing, information processing. Um, and more recently, the alpha, uh, especially the lower alpha range, has been thought of as representing brain regions that are under inhibitory or cognitive control. There's something modulating uh, processing in these regions. So 
the first hypothesis would be, well, obviously we might find an increase in alpha in regions uh, representing the hippocampus or the MTL because this is really the, the site of which inhibitory control has been uh, uh, targeted. Secondly, uh, oscillations in the theta band. Um, increases in theta activity have been found in selective retrieval, um, such as uh, something that's more difficult to retrieve. Uh, you see larger increases in theta. And it's really thought to underlie PFC hippocampal MTL communication. And of course, we're not doing selective retrieval in these tasks, but what we're doing is controlling or modulating retrieval in some manner such that increases in theta might definitely be involved in inhibitory control uh, in, in these processes as well. So we might find increases in theta in the PFC uh, hippocampus and MTL, um, and this would be the sources and the sites of, of control uh, over LTM. So if we first look at alpha, for the condition of no think versus think, um, roughly 36 subjects in this study. Uh, and so we look at no think versus think, we see increased alpha in parietal regions here. And if you look at the topography over time, you see that it occurs between four, roughly 400 and 800 milliseconds. Uh, when the stimulus occurs. In, in the trial where you have the red square? Yes, exactly. Yes, the experimental phase. <clears throat> when you look at theta, uh, you see a similar story in parietal regions here. Uh, no think greater than think. And I should say that this indication of parietal up into central parietal and back is probably representative of the hippocampus or MTL. Um, and if you look at the topography across time from 500 to 800 milliseconds, we see increases in theta. If you look at more constricted uh, analyses, if you look at no-think trials that were actually forgotten uh, as compared to remembered, and if you remember from the fMRI results, we were talking about the uh, modulation of the hippocampus occurring during the second half of the experiment. What we're looking at is second half versus first, so what's greater in the second half and what's greater in forgotten versus remembered trials. What we now see is increased theta in frontal regions. And the topography here looks about 200 to 600 milliseconds. And if you look at simply the condition in which suppression or inhibitory control over long-term memory is most likely to occur, uh, no think trials that are forgotten during the second half versus remember during the second half. What you see now is a full or more complete story of frontal, temporal, which may be indicative of the hippocampus as well, and, and the parietal cortex. So this topography across time is very similar as well, 300 to uh, 700 milliseconds. I don't understand about forgotten in the second half. You know, Can Sorry. You yeah, sure. Exactly what sure. the condition is? Yeah. So it's just uh, when you do the testing phase at the end, obviously some people are. Under EEG control, right? No. This is during the experimental phase. So the testing phase at the end is just simply recall. You just give them a sheet and you tell them to write down the, what the, the original pairing okay. was. So they've forgotten it. So these data are collected <coughs> just during the no think phase? Just like the fMRI study. Control, what, 128 electrodes? Yeah, 128 geodesic. Okay. <coughs> but what's before time zero? What does that mean if we don't have a comparison? It's the baseline, right? So you do baseline selection, and you, you subtract out, you have, I think the baseline in this is uh, uh, 500 to 200 milliseconds pre-stimulus. So this is not on the raw EPT, it's on the average 
subtraction, power subtraction. Yeah. Of estimated sources. Yeah. And where are the electrons? You have the where did you put the, you have a whole bunch of electrons it, all over? Yeah, it's a net. It's a hundred and twenty eight channel net. Well, when you start off with baseline correction, you're, you're essentially equating these two conditions. So at the zero, at minus 200 seconds, uh, milliseconds pre-stimulus, they're equated. Yeah. Uh huh. This yeah right. So <clears throat> these two are on no think versus think, right? So just tell me again what this means. You subtract it. No think trials. So we're looking at the signal in which no think trials is greater than think. So it's a subtraction of no think versus think. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving because we're getting, we're running out of time here. So uh, what it appears to be is that increases in alpha and the parietal uh, indicate regions that might be under inhibitory control like the hippocampus or MTL. Increases in theta and frontal and parietal uh, suggests that there's increased communication between the PFC and hippocampus and MTL. Um, and what I would suggest is that in, this indicates that pattern completion may be uh, being downregulated. Okay, so the overall implication so far from neuroimaging is that the right middle funnel uh, gyrus appears to communicate with the hippocampus MTL to downregulate uh, this activity. We've seen this through various imaging uh, uh, methods that the neuro and <coughs> the neuroanatomy relates to a uh, degree of inhibitory control that's implemented. We saw a decreased volume of the hippocampal complex that related to increased inhibitory control. Uh, and from neural oscillations, we see that, that this might be affecting the degree of pattern completion. So what we wanted to do now is look at inhibitory control over multiple psychological domains. And it's the case that uh, we wanted to ask the question whether the right lateral prefrontal cortex is involved in, in uh, downregulation of uh, memory, again, emotion, and uh, motor response. And so one of the things that we wanted to focus on was whether uh, we see common versus distinct activation in the right lateral prefrontal cortex. And what this really is going to suggest is well, is there ev any evidence of, of kind of this general inhibitory mechanism? So uh, we've now extended the model to look at uh, long-term inhibitory control over long-term memory from the right MFG to posterior hippocampal complex. Uh, we're looking at motor response, so we know from the literature that the right IFG uh, has pathways that connect to the subthalamic nucleus, which um, is excitatory in uh, synapses on GABAergic cells that shut down uh, pathways in the globus pallidus uh, by increasing inhibition so that uh, normal communication through the thalamus routed up to the motor cortex is stopped as a gating mechanism. Uh, and then obviously uh, we know that the OFC um, has some inhibitory control over the amygdala at some higher cognitive level and we wanted to ask what is the relationship between these areas um, and, and whether we see any of these being some sort of general mechanism. So again, we're looking at regions of the right lateral prefrontal cortex associated with inhibitory control across domain. And we wanted to ask how do individual differences in inhibitory control manifest across task? Um, and importantly, uh, this can only really be done uh, with a within subjects design. These are some preliminary results uh, from 20 people that we've run so far. Um, we'd like to increase the sample by double uh, and able to look at individual differences a little bit better. Um, 
so we use the same think no think task. I'll go over this really quick because uh, we've already looked at the results from this. But we use non-emotional pictorial stimuli this time to see if the circuitry still was uh, uh, to see if whether the circuitry was dependent on emotion or not. Uh, we replicated the previous findings. We see increased right MFG activity uh, in the condition for no think greater than think. When you look at the reverse, you see decreased activity in the parahippocampal gyrus and the visual cortex. If you look at a correlation between these two, you see a nice negative correlation suggesting that increases in right MFG activity correlate with decreases in hippocampal activity. Um, so <clears throat> when we look at emotion, uh, we wanted to ask whether regions of the right lateral prefrontal cortex, uh, similarly to the orbital frontal cortex, uh, does shows increased activation when uh, you have some inhibitory control over emotion. And we wanted to ask what the relationship of the right lateral prefrontal cortex and the OFC was with the amygdala. So the task we used is an emotion regulation task. Uh, in one condition, individuals see a negative picture and they're told to feel. So they're told to feel or experience the emotion. Uh, in another condition, they're told to inhibit. So they're told to passively view and do not experience the emotion. When we look at the fMRI results, what we see is a similar story. We see right MFG again but we also see orbital frontal cortex showing increased activity, more of this same inhibitory circuit. And we also see, when we look at uh, sit, uh, the condition in which you feel greater than inhibit, or the reverse of the, this contrast, we see lots of decreased activity in the ventral visual processing stream and then decreased bilateral amygdala activity. When we look at the correlations, what we see is uh, right middle frontal gyrus um, correlates positively with the right OFC such that increased activity in the right MFG correlates with increased activity in the OFC and that the right OFC appears to uh, downregulate the amygdala such that increased activity in right OFC uh, with decreased amygdala. Okay, so now when we go to motor, um, we wanted to ask, do both dorsal and ventral regions of the right lateral prefrontal cortex uh, show increased activation during uh, inhibitory control over motor? In past studies, what you see a lot is the focus is on right IFG, um, although right MFG has is, is become just as apparent as showing increased activation. So we also wanted to ask, uh, what the relationship is with the subthalamic nucleus. As I said before, this is a circuit that goes from right IFG to the subthalamic nucleus to, uh, to inhibit the globus pallidus. Um, and the task that we used here is a simple stop signal task. The basic take home message is that 75% of the trials are no signal. Press left or right depending on what the arrow is. In 25% of the trials, what happens is the arrow comes up, you receive a box. When you receive that box, you're told to withhold your response. If you get the red box, it means that you couldn't withhold your response. And this uh, is titrated to an individual's reaction time so that 50% of the trials they will be able to withhold, 50% of the trials they won't be able to withhold. So it's actually the inhibitory control over an already engaged motor response. When we look at activation, uh, once again, what we see is right MFG, uh, more, more posterior, uh, and we also see right IFG, two very common areas that come up in this task. Uh, we looked at the uh, correlation between uh, these regions in the STN, or the subthalamic nucleus, the one that provided the best implication is that increased activity in the right MFG uh, correlated with increased activity in the subthalamic nucleus. Okay, so that we've seen now single task results. We show that right lateral prefrontal cortex is engaged in modulating uh, these posterior subcortical regions. We see that right middle frontal gyrus 
is, is involved in memory over the hippocampus and MTL. We also see implications of it with uh, motor control, uh, communicating with the subthalamic nucleus. We also see implications of it with the right orbital frontal cortex or orbital frontal cortex in general uh, with the amygdala. So it's really becoming more apparent now that the right MFG is critical in all three tasks. Um, <clears throat> and we wanted to ask, well, if this is really the case, does it indicate that the right MFG is, is, uh, shows brain behavior relationships across tasks? So we tested this by using behavioral performance in uh, the two tasks that weren't tested with the fMRI. So uh, let me just get to the next slide. I think it'll become more clear. This is a little confusing, but if we look in the brain activation in inhibitory control over memory, and we correlate the behavioral performance of motor control, so inhibitory control over motor, what do we see? We see increased activation in right MFG. If we look at behavioral performance on inhibiting emotion, how well individuals were able to decrease their level of physiological response to the emotional pictures. Same area. If we look at brain activation in the stop signal task or inhibitory control over motor, and uh, we look at behavioral performance in inhibitory control over memory, same region of right MFG posterior for motor control. Behavioral performance in emotion, we see right IFG. So two areas that came up originally for the motor task. When we look at brain activation in uh, inhibitory control over emotion and cor uh, correlate the behavioral performance in memory, we see OFC, increases in OFC, right inferior frontal gyrus, again, with performance in the motor task. So it appears as though behavioral performance across inhibitory control shows this generalized effect that upregulates this right lateral prefrontal cortical activity in each task. <clears throat> the next question that we wanted to ask was whether general behavioral inhibitory control, so now we have this idea that these inhibitory control processes are linked. If we take a composite measure across all three performances um, and we look at brain activation with inhibitory control over memory, this is the region that comes up, anterior right middle frontal gyrus. If we look at brain activation with composite inhibitory control over all three tasks. That's what comes up in the motor response task. And with emotion regulation or emotional control, again. So it appears as though if you look at inhibitory control now across these tasks, you see this general inhibitory control is represented uh, in the right MFG. Okay, so we next want to move to uh, combine functional connectivity analyses. And I'll go through this quickly because we're running out of time here. But what we've done now is to use independent components analysis. So independent components analysis for investigating uh, fMRI data, it's a model-free data-driven approach. There's no model set up to, to examine the data, right? We've done this spatially and temporally with ICA. Uh, we've done ICA with dual regression with the GLM, so general linear model, the standard way to analyze uh, fMRI data. And this basically just means is that you use ICA and then you run some kind of regression uh, with the GLM to see what the corresponding results are. We've done this with the GLM, which is just a model-based approach. We've done seed-based functional connectivity uh, with the whole brain and then PPI or psychophysiological interaction. So what do we see when we look at inhibitory control over memory? We see uh, some of the primary components as being, so these are ICA components. We're gonna do spatial, temporal, and a dual regression. So what are the components that correlate with the GLM design matrix or the model of of what the fMRI conditional data is. 
So we see downregulation of the ventral visual processing stream and hippocampus. Area that comes up in the prefrontal cortex, right MFG. Inhibitory control over emotion, we see increases in, in uh, the orbital frontal cortex. We see decreases of the amygdala and the uh, ventral visual processing stream. Increases in prefrontal regions OFC, again, right middle frontal gyrus. And then if you take the correlation of these components across, you see the most uh, correlated component is just this right middle frontal gyrus or this huge swath of, of right lateral prefrontal cortex. Yeah, sure. So, well, it's, 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 the seed, it's a seed-based approach. So what you do is you just take the region of the ICA-based well, approach. ICA, you get some right. You take a component. Right. How do you do that? It's whatever correlates with the GLM well, the design matrix. Are boxes. What's that? There are going to be many components that are boxes or conditions. No, not an ICA. There's the, it, uh, yeah, it, well, right. Well, it's what correlates highest with with the GLM design matrix. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So, so when you do ICA based in FSL, what it does is it, it, it only gives you, it, it estimates the amount of components that, that make up uh, well, the factors, the variance, and you basically get any components, you have to pick one based on the knowledge. So that's no, it's, it's not based on the knowledge, it's what's, what correlates highly with the, with, the, uh, with the GLM design matrix. So you, ent you enter the GLM design matrix into your ICA approach. Okay, so you're doing regression yep. on the ICA, all the components yep. at once. Yep. Okay. Yeah, what it does is it rank orders the components based on what the regression is with the GLM design so matrix. The threshold for which you have to choose, Sure, of course. Yeah, well, I, I mean, ICA is, is subjective in general. Yeah, it's subjective in general. Yeah. Sure. Are you running block design or event-related? Event-related designs. Everything's event-related. Everything's event-related. OK, so uh, if we take the ICA seed and we take this right MFG and we do a whole brain connectivity analysis, uh, what do we see? So what we see is that downregulation in ventral visual processing stream and the hippocampus. If we reverse this and just do the converse of it and make the seed as the hippocampus and do whole brain connectivity with it, doesn't matter if you use the left or right, you get right MFG. So what we've also done now is to look at DTI and look at functional anisotropy, which is just basically a measure of integrity of the white matter tracks. We've done this in two different regions now. The first is the uh, cingulum bundle, which I talked about, which connects regions of dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex down into retrosplenial and then to the hippocampal posterior areas of the hippocampal complex. Uh, and so if you do probabilistic tracking, you can see that we have nice results um, on different segments of the brain here, but you can see the, the, the gist of it. And when you look at functional anisotropy and you correlate it with inhibitory success, uh, these are preliminary data. What you see is that the worse you are at inhibiting uh, long-term memory, the, uh, the, the, more, uh, the less integrity you have of the white matter tract. We also looked at this with the uncinate fasciculus, 
uh, regions uh, or a white matter tract connecting orbital frontal cortex, inferior frontal gyrus, around into the amygdala and the temporal gyrus. If you look at this, we have nice probabilistic uh, tracking results. Um, and then what you see is increased white matter integrity or uh, with, with greater inhibitory control over emotion, or the worse you are at inhibiting emotion, uh, uh, the less integrity of this white matter tract. So these single task results indicate increased activation of right lateral prefrontal cortex, coinciding with this down regulation or modulation of posterior subcortical regions. We've seen this in the single task results. These suggest that there's these distinct mechanisms uh, correlations show increased behavioral performance from one task to another, um, and this indicates a general behavioral inhibitory control. Uh, a cross-task composite behavioral performance correlates with overlapping anterior right MFG in all tasks. Uh, it highlights a prominent role in uh, inhibitory control across psychological domain, and it indicates or starts to suggest that there might be this general common mechanism. Um, <clears throat> we've also uh, looked at this with combined functional connectivity with the ICA and GLM approaches. Um, it seems to be fruitful in elucidating the specific mechanisms um, and, and continues with, uh, we'd like to continue this with more of the general mechanisms. And we've seen that functional anisotropy or the integrity of white matter tracts uh, with DTI indicates uh, that this is related to inhibitory control as well. So I'll go through this quick. I know we're, uh, we're right about time right now. Uh, so one of the most important things though is, is how this translates to psychiatric populations. <coughs> so we want to apply the model um, to investigate the inhibitory deficits in, in psychiatric populations. And this would be really in hopes of, of identifying brain regions that are dysfunctional um, and elucidating potential biomarkers. We've done a lot with ADHD. Uh, I thought that PTSD was more prevalent, uh, prevalent and, and uh, uh, related to this, this crowd, so we'll talk about PTSD a little bit. <clears throat> so individuals with PTSD we know have these recurring visual flashbacks of traumatic events. And we simply wanted to ask, could this be related to deficits in inhibitory control over long-term memory retrieval? Um, and does the efficacy of inhibitory control of long-term memory depend on whether the information is negative or not? If it's neutral, do they reflect the same dysfunction? So this is preliminary data. Uh, these are previously deployed combat veterans uh, recruited in connection with the Denver VA. Uh, we used two tasks looking at inhibitory control. We looked at a stop signal task. We also looked at the think, no think, which I'll, uh, I'll cover, uh, but I won't talk much about motor response. But these two are related within PTSD populations as well. So if you again look at baseline corrected accuracy scores, you can see that the neutral information here, uh, they show no no problem suppressing it. This is an effect that's pretty common to normals, uh, control populations, 15% reduction. Whereas with the negative information, they show no suppression or inhibition at all. So if we look at correlations uh, between their behavioral performance um, just within the PTSD population, and we look at the correlations with uh, just the negative information, how well they do suppressing negative information. There's enough variance to look at these correlations in gray matter analysis. So this is just VBM, uh, gray matter, looking at changes. The regions that seem to correlate with performance in uh, inhibiting negative material, anterior insula, reduced gray matter, reduced gray matter, leading into right inferior frontal gyrus, reduced gray matter in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex or orbital frontal cortex. When we look at a group analysis, 
14 PTSD individuals versus 12 uh, combat deployed, but no psychiatric condition controls. What we see is decreased gray matter in the PTSD individuals in the amygdala in a region bordering on IFG, right MFG, and <clears throat> orbital frontal cortex as well. Uh, right. So we know that individuals with PTSD exhibit these deficits in inhibitory control over long-term memory. Uh, it's been seen, we've seen it in, in gray matter analyses. Uh, we'd like to look at it with functional uh, fMRI next. Uh, only inhibitory control over negative long-term memory uh, retrieval appears to be affected, raising the possibility that it's this heightened encoding of negative information, this is nothing new, uh, or that it's just a lack of control over uh, encoding of this negative information. So we've identified some neural circuitry that's been identified in our models. Uh, okay, so we'll just get to conclusions now. Right lateral prefrontal cortex, I'm sure you're sick of me saying this, <laughs> appears to be important for implementing inhibitory control across various psychological domains. Uh, individual regions of right lateral prefrontal cortex appear down to downregulate or modulate specific patterns of posterior subcortical processing. So we really see these indications of distinct circuitry, uh, right middle frontal gyrus, parahippocampus uh, downregulation, hippocampal downregulation, right MFG, right IFG, and subthalamic nucleus, right MFG and uh, right orbital frontal cortex, uh, down-regulating re visual cortex and amygdala. But we also see this now indication of a, a general or common mechanism, which might be the case of this right middle frontal gyrus that keeps coming up. So what is the role of the right MFG? And this is, I think, is a big question during inhibitory control across tasks. Um, <clears throat> and I think the suggestion is, is that this might be very important for goal maintenance and implementation of inhibitory control. So we want to start specifying this more. Future directions, we're looking at uh, some neurotransmitter levels using GABA spectroscopy uh, and genetic variation within the neural circuitry. We're looking at GABA and dopamine. Uh, and we've noticed these uh, gradients within the right lateral prefrontal cortex. So the dorsal ventral gradient right MFG to right IFG, uh, anterior, posterior. Uh, dorsal ventral might be this hierarchy of control or abstraction, anterior, posterior. Definitely might be this hierarchy of uh, abstraction we submit in R21 to investigate these questions. Uh, I'd like to also finish collecting data with individuals with PTSD and acquire grant funding to utilize fMRI. I think I'll skip this. We have some new results of GABA spectroscopy, but it, it, it appears that it's, uh, it's starting to look pretty good. Um, and then uh, just as, as a final point, and perhaps lead to some discussion, it seems like this right-sided predominance of the prefrontal cortex uh, uh, controlling or underlying inhibitory control perhaps provides this fast global processing uh, which the left side is, is, uh, does not do as well. Um, it coincides with also the right amygdala rapid threat detection with, with faces and body posture. Um, so it could be the case that you get this quick representation of threat context and, and uh, selection or uh, uh, an inhibition of the appropriate motor behavior. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, yeah, we, have, we haven't analyzed the data, um, and I'm not sure if I will, but we, we look at the eyes. People are looking away or closing their eyes, they're not. And if you look at the ERP components for the occipital cortex, they process the, both cues and the think and the no think condition to the same level. 
Good question, though. Actually, on that, um, on that note, um, do you, my question is, do you have an uh, idea about the extent to which your um, theta and your alpha results are due to induced versus evoked uh, activity? You mentioned that it seems to be equated with your event-related potential. Right. Well, uh, so the idea is that in, with the ERPs, what we sh I didn't show the data, but with the ERPs, uh, what we're showing is, um, so there's the parietal, there's a component called the parietal new component. Basically, when you show individuals uh, certain stimuli that they've studied before versus completely new stimuli, you get this heightened parietal effect for th the stimuli that's been remembered, right? Well, this is just the pride of old, old new component in general. But the, so if you just, uh, that, that component just shows uh, greater response to old than new. And it looks to be the same way with this as well. Um, the, <coughs> no think trials show almost no, uh, Increase. So if you look at no think forgotten versus no think remembered, you look at a baseline trial that we have in there. So um, this is increased for think trials, decreased for no think trials. So it appears to be that the ERP component might be reflective of this uh, uh, alpha. Did you, I'm sorry, did you say theta or alpha? Well, both, but mm -hmm. the, you know, the EP is within the theta range. Right. Yeah. Than the no thing. Mm -hmm. in, your, in the oscillate, in the frequency domain data that you showed, mm -hmm. the no thing, you were showing areas that are where the no thing was larger. Right. Right. So that would, that would indicate that it's less likely to be influenced by the SEP component. Well, it depends on how, how these relate to each other, right? So just because this is showing little decrease, I mean, it still uh, could be controlled by frontal parietal communication or, or, or uh, frontal uh, right MFG increases in theta communication sure, with, sure, with sure. the hippocampus. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. Let me suggest you guys follow that line of discussion. Sure, sure. In your global large scale network model, yeah, the hippocampus project to the prefrontal cortex, but the way back, it's sort of circumstantial. You mentioned only the subthalamic nucleus in the motor inhibition, but you left out the basal forebrain system. You know, we described 15 years ago that the prefrontal cortex project to the goboagic basal forebrain neurons, which is likely uh, have a widespread projection. Uh, right, so... So the link, I know, you know, direct or indirect is an issue in the well, functional connectivity, but you have a big gap there from the prefrontal to the cognitive or the, um, the way backwards. So what you find... I, I'm sorry, for the for inhibitory response over motor control or for inhibitory... Well, no, or hippocampus? I could buy if Jim agreed that the subthalamic nucleus is okay. But for cognitive or emotional, uh, you still have a gap how the prefrontal IMG or OFG affect hippocampal, entorhinal, whatever. So uh, I propose actually that we should look the base of forming government. So yeah, right. So there is which has a direct projection, glutamate projection from the prefrontal cortex. Right. So right, uh, ventral medial prefrontal cortex is primarily known right of the hippocampal prefrontal pathway, but that really comes from CA2 uh, to the uh, ventral medial prefrontal cortex, and that's something that that we looked at as well because. The projections from that reach the nucleus accumbens, um, and uh, they allow for dopaminergic innervation. Yeah, so that that is something that we've yep that we've looked at as well. Sure if you've got it, though, he, what he's talking about is that you, you're looking at cortical regions that are distant 
connected by three dimensional connection. Mm -hmm. Right. You say uh, sectors of uh, physical cortex are right, right. all the others are inhibited. Yeah. Yet they talk by two dimensional connections. Well, so, so you need some kind of. Right, exactly. Way to yeah, so if you look into the animal literature, in, uh, so uh, I've done this, uh, I don't have it all mapped out well, but there are definitely distinct um, GABAergic populations in posterior uh, entorhinal cortex and then also in more posterior regions of the hippocampal complex in which the cingulum bundle also project onto. And then also uh, through the, for the uh, frontal occipital fasciculus, uh, MFG projects onto in the entorhinal cortex. So yeah, it is glutamatergic, but it, it synapses primarily onto these cell populations uh, uh, of GABAergic cells that, that might control like a gating mechanism. Uh, we are talking about the opposite direction. So not the entorhinal to prefrontal, but from the prefrontal to uh, amygdala or hippocampus. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, and I, I think it's uh, it, it's remarkable because if you go to, gosh, sorry. One, well, so you want to say it's the general. I, right. I'm wondering about your stimuli, how much it might be. Right. Because there's no, you're very careful, it seems, to not include anything with words or, you know, so if you yeah. say word for a go, no, go. Or your yeah, thing, we've, you, right, we've. That might We've done it with, with words as well, yeah, with, with just verbal labels, and other people have as well. But I'm, I mean, that's... It, it, yeah, oh yeah, it's in the exact same. So it, it, it appears, you know, obviously that's a, that's a great question because one of the first things we thought or the verbal nature of it, might, you might get left. But it doesn't seem to be the case, and, and whether it's... Uh, emotion, whether it's uh, memory, whether it's um, uh, motor control, you get, I mean, this is right down the midline. It, it's amazing how that, that always appears, that, that you get that. So that's one of the, one of the future things is, is to write a review paper of the right lateral prefrontal cortex and in, inhibition. Sorry? Yeah. Ask them what kind of strategy do you say to inhibit their memory? Okay. So, uh, right. Um, I th that's, that's a great question as well. So, we, we always ask the strategy. Uh, we've done numerous analyses on it. it. It doesn't depend on what the strategy is. Whatever in people's individual strategy is, I think what happens, so you might think that some people, well, there's categories. Two likely ones come to mind. Some people try to clear their heads. People try to think of something else. If you look at those two antithesis or, or paradoxical strategies, what happens is, is it appears that it doesn't matter, but whatever they try to do, it sets this circuitry off. I think it's probably some uh, avoidance circuitry. Nope. Specifically, we don't tell them. But you asked them afterwards what yep. they were doing? Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so you'll go with Denny. Denny. It was taken there.